In the ever-growing and increasingly divisive debate over homosexuality and same-sex unions, many Christians rightly look to Scripture for answers. God tends to know about these sorts of things. The problem, however, is that Scripture is not always read correctly, and human beings have a tendency to pick and choose which passages best support their argument, or, worse yet, assume that the Bible says something it actually does not. This will simply not do. What does and doesn't the Bible actually say about homosexuality, and how should this influence our approach today? This is Catholicism in Focus. Right off the bat, it's important to note that the Bible isn't written like canon law or the Summa Theologia, systematically and comprehensively explaining every moral topic in great detail. By and large, the Bible is a collection of interlocking but ultimately independent stories. Meaning, there is no passage that speaks to the concept of homosexuality per se. There are a few passages that speak of homosexual acts, but often mixed together with other circumstances that make any definitive statement about homosexuality difficult to make. Not impossible, and ultimately not ambiguous, but also not as clear as some might make it out to be. Take, for instance, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah found in Genesis 19. For many people, this is the quintessential example of why homosexuality is wrong and what is most quoted in debates. For those unfamiliar with the story, two angels arrived in a city called Sodom and were welcomed into the home of a man named Lot. During the night, the men of the city surrounded the house, demanding to have sexual relations with the two visitors. The action of the men was so egregious and repugnant that God set fire to the city and the term sodomy was born. But is this story specifically about homosexuality? the Bible itself is split. In the New Testament letter Jude, we are taught that Sodom and Gomorrah's sin was that they indulged in sexual promiscuity and practiced unnatural vice, a statement strongly implying homosexuality, but not stating it explicitly. Similarly, the prophet Jeremiah focuses on the sexual nature of the sin, but it is a bit more broad. Their sin was not homosexuality in itself, but adultery and deception. Second Peter mentions nothing of the actions themselves, but simply refers to the two cities as godless people. This is more in line with the way that Jesus approaches the topic, never referencing anything regarding sexuality, but four times condemning them for not accepting God's word. But even still, there is a third interpretation. According to the prophet Ezekiel, the reason Sodom was destroyed had nothing to do with sexual misconduct or faith, but everything to do with greed and injustice. Now look at the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were proud, sated with food, complacent in prosperity. They did not give any help to the poor and needy. Instead, they became arrogant and committed abominations before me. Then, as you have seen, I removed them." Five passages and not a single reference to homosexuality in itself. Which is not to say that it isn't implied or wouldn't have been understood by those hearing these teachings, but it should caution us from using the passage of Sodom and Gomorrah as definitive evidence against homosexuality. Another passage that is often used in such debates is Romans 1 verses 26 through 27. Therefore, God handed them over to degrading passions. Their females exchanged natural relations for unnatural, and the males likewise gave up natural relations with females and burned with lust for one another. Males did shameful things with males and thus received in their own persons the due penalty for their perversity. Unlike the passage of Sodom and Gomorrah, this passage appears to be speaking more directly to homosexuality in itself. Women that have relations with women or men that have relations with men choose something perverse. And yet, scholars have noted that it still may not be speaking to homosexuality as we understand it today, but rather to straight married men and women who choose to leave their wives and husbands to lie with each other. Even today, proponents of same-sex unions can agree with Paul that leaving your husband or wife to lie with another probably isn't a good thing. The passage is likely about homosexuality, but it could just as easily be read as condemning adultery. The same issue may be at play in passages like 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10 and 1 Timothy 1, 10, in which lists are given for those who will be excluded from the kingdom of heaven and sodomites are listed. At first reading, it would seem pretty clear that the text is referring explicitly to homosexuality. And yet, the note from the New American Bible, the translation produced by the Catholic bishops, offers a helpful insight. The Greek word translated as boy prostitutes may refer to catamites, boys or young men who were kept for the purposes of prostitution, a practice not uncommon in the Greco-Roman world. In Greek mythology, this was the function of Ganymede, the cupbearer of the gods, whose Latin name was catamitis. The term translated sodomites refers to adult males who indulged in homosexual practices with such boys. It's possible, even probable, that what's being condemned here is not homosexuality as a concept or same-sex unions as we understand them today, but pedophilia. While we can read the word sodomite as its modern equivalent, the fact of the matter is that homosexuality as it exists today would have been a foreign concept to ancient writers, and so it is unlikely that we are going to find a direct condemnation in the Bible of monogamous same-sex unions debated today. The Bible is an old book, 
it doesn't have a direct teaching for every modern reality. Of course, this is not to say that the Bible is completely silent or ambiguous on the matter either, and Christians have felt confident for centuries teaching definitively on the matter. One of the reasons for this is chapter 18 of the book of Leviticus, where we read, You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. Such a thing is an abomination. Similarly, in chapter 20, we read, If a man lies with a male as with a woman, they have committed an abomination. The two of them shall be put to death. Their blood guilt is upon them. Here we see no mitigating circumstances or potential areas for misinterpretations. The passage clearly states that sexual acts between a male and a male are not approved by the law. Which would seem to be definitive enough for our discussion, but even still, it may not be the most compelling argument. Surely, there will be some that point out that Christians are no longer bound by the law of Moses, and even though we know that moral truths are part of the eternal law and do not change, some may not be convinced. Which is why I believe there is a far more compelling argument to be made from Scripture than the ones usually quoted, and it might serve us well to avoid the above passages and look in a different direction. When asking the question of whether same-sex unions have a place in the church today, it might be helpful to look to Scripture to acknowledge that none exists. In the 2,000-odd pages of the book, in the hundreds of stories and dozens of relationships, not a single instance can be found of God speaking favorably of, endorsing, consecrating, or acknowledging in a covenant a couple in a same-sex union. And so, the strongest argument in understanding the will of God on this subject is not what may or may not be condemned, but in what God institutes and upholds. In the beginning, God created man and woman and destined them for each other. Throughout history, God brought men and women together in marriage for mutual support and childbearing. In literally every image, every metaphor, and every example of marriage, it is a matter of bride and bridegroom. Which is why the church has, for centuries, been very clear in its teaching. Marriage is between a man and a woman, and the proper ends of all sexual acts are directed towards the union of the couple and procreation. Acts that are closed to either purpose have never been, nor ever will be, permitted. But this is not the same as homosexuality or same-sex attraction in itself. While the Bible may be clear in its condemnation of certain actions, it would be a major mistake to read the Bible as condemning people with same-sex attractions or treating them as unfit for the kingdom. The Bible teaches clearly that all are created in God's image and likeness, all are his children, and all are saved by his mercy. Taking a stance against homosexual actions may be our biblical responsibility, but judging, condemning, or casting out people simply for how they are created couldn't be further from the true teaching of the Bible.